Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the second Joint Foreman's Catello uh, Sprint demo. Um, you can see that we have a full agenda, so I'm going to ask the presenters pay attention to the timer um, and move along quickly. Um, I will show the timer in my window. Uh, also, note uh, for presenters, um, if you haven't ever seen it before, uh, there is a nice demo checklist uh, of information um, for making sure that what you're going to show is already set and good for uh, those watching. Um, with uh, that, uh, we'll get started with uh, Ori uh, showing off new fields and actions in Discovery. Hi, guys. Uh, okay, I've been working on changes to the Discovery plugin. Um, You're a little quiet, Ori. Okay, let's try to get closer. Uh, First thing is there are new fields in the discovered host. Uh, CPU, memory, discount, and disk sizes, they all come from uh, uh, the facts, um, but they are integers to help search and sort. So CPU, for example, uh, we have the fact physical processor count. Uh, but you can only check if it's equal to something because it's a string. But for CPU count, we can check if it's larger than 1 or less than everything that you can do on an integer. You can sort uh, the field. Um, now, the CPU um, it actually comes from a physical processor count right now. There was a discussion on IRC, should it be from processor count? So if anyone has uh, input, if you want to change this, then uh, please talk to me. The next thing is the reboot action that was added um, to the index page. It's also in the host itself, uh, which reboots the host. And then uh, to get it rediscovered and everything. Um, they were both also added to the API, so they now exist in the Hammer plugin for Discovery. Yeah. Now the reboot exists. Also, refresh facts that wasn't in the API it was added to the API so it can be seen in Hammer, and it is also well seen right now. What's missing is still the auto provision, which is new, and delete, so these will be added later. Um, the list output already looks like the new UI with all the fields, except that it still hasn't been merged, so I won't show you that today. There were more uh, changes that had to do with uh, the implementation of Discovery, that it uh, now can, talk to, it can support posts through uh, Smart Proxy and not only Foreman directly, uh, with uh, the use of Shlomi's uh, Smart Proxy um, plugin, but uh, Shlomi is not showing that today, so uh, I guess you'll see that part next time. Um, that's it for me. All right. Uh, thanks, Ori. Um, quick note uh, to everyone uh, that I forgot whilst, before starting. Um, if you are an early presenter, uh, please uh, leave the Hangout after you're done presenting. Um, please pay attention, presenters, to the order. Uh, and uh, don't join if you are later in the presentation. Um, also, for those watching, uh, please use the question and answers app uh, to ask questions. And we will ask them uh, at the end of each individual presenter's uh, section um, so that uh, they have a chance to answer before they leave the Hangout. Um, uh, some more discovery uh, with Greg. Thanks, Eric. So, yeah, I'm going to move really fast on this. Um, one of the features we wanted to get into the next big discovery release was um, the ability to extend the image at boot time with your own custom stuff. 
So I'm going to show you a prototype of that. I'm going to kick off just by rebooting my discovered host because it takes a little while to come up and I don't want to spend time waiting for it. You can see I've got no discovered host in my index at the moment. So while that's booting, I'll show you what's happening. I've created a zip file. The format looks something like this. So we have a bin directory with some files in it. We have a fax directory with some custom fax in it. We have a lib directory with some libraries. And in that, we have a Ruby lib directory with some Ruby libraries. All of this stuff gets used. We package that up in a zip, something like this, zip minus R. At the moment, it's hard coded. You have to use extension.zip. That's going to become flexible in the next few days so that you can specify it in the pixie boot, uh, just like we do with the URL and, and so on. But for now, it's hard coded. Um, you zip it up. You put it on your form and server or on your proxy. Um, and it downloads it as it boots up. Uh, and then it unpacks it. It adds the bin to the path. It adds the lib to the LD library path. It adds lib Ruby to the Ruby lib. And it also adds fax to the factor lib. So all of this gets set up automatically. If you have an auto start file, it will run it at the end of that setup process. So you can add scripts to set up your RAID controller, run a BIOS update, whatever you need. Um, and then, then it will report into formants. Obviously, the custom facts that you put in will also be there. So just to show you what we're going to expect to see, um, if we have a look in our auto start, I'm going to set it. Um, obviously, you can configure the password on the discovery image, but I thought I'd set up a key for fun. Uh, I'm just going to echo into a temp file just here. And then I'm going to try and use the binary. So I'm going to use NTP date to set the time. And I'm going to use Ruby minus R test to try and load my test library that's in the extension. So um, the interesting thing here is NTP date requires uh, libcrypto. Libcrypto isn't in our image, so it will have to find this file for it to work. So uh, if we just have a look, it's finished booting. So if I come back here and I just log in, and I oh, the NTP date didn't work. Ah, I worked on test like five minutes ago, and obviously something's changed. Um, TP dates minus B. Okay, so that's working. Um, something odd happened with the path, no doubt. So you can get the idea. The idea is that you set up all your library stuff, and if very quickly we just refresh here, I've got 30 seconds. So I've got my reported host. If I come down here and I look at the bottom, test extension has the value with libs. If I just go back here and cat, that's what I was expecting, test extension with libs. So it's reported the extra fact in as well, and then you can use that for your policies and all the rest of it. So that's the basic idea. I'm done with two seconds to spare. Questions? Uh, looks like you have one question. Uh, can I have multiple extensions or only one zip file? Currently one, multiple is definitely planned, will probably be sorted when it's merged in the next few days. It's not very difficult. All right. Uh, thanks, Greg. Um, up next, we have uh, Joseph talking about API token authentication and turbo links. Maybe Joseph is not available yet, so we'll move uh, um, um, uh, I'm here, just getting off of mute. Can everyone see my screen? Can I share my screen? Kind of scratchy your audio, Joseph. Excuse me? Your audio is kind of scratchy and grabby. My audio is not good if I get closer to the computer. Is that better? Uh, now it's just louder, but still kind of grabby. Do you want me to continue, or do you want me to stop and try to go to a different room? Um, let's, uh, I'll move to the next person, and then we'll come back. OK. Um, uh, so next up, we will be Homer uh, talking about the dashboard rewrite. OK, so. Um, this is uh, following my, uh, you can click my screen share so I will miss it. Uh, following my mail about uh, the rewriting the dashboard, basically the idea is uh, allow more customization and uh, more uh, extensibility of the dashboard for the users. Um, can you see my screen? 
we can. Okay. Um, so uh, basically, the dashboard now will have two buttons on each widget. One will just hide the widget. The other one completely removes it. Uh, it widgets are saved uh, uh, per user, and not uh, the previous default was saving them in uh, local storage, which changes from computer to computer. Now they are saved in the dat database for the users. And uh, say you want uh, this host, which is very important to you. You want to see its runtime on the dashboard all the time. Just click Add to Dashboard. And you can see the runtime run for this host on your dashboard whenever you need it. Um, that's basically it. If there are any more questions about it. Uh, looks like no questions. OK, thank you. Thank you, Tomer. OK, I can try again to share. Or can you hear me now, Eric? Uh, we can. It's still a little gravelly, but I think if you speak uh, slowly, we'll be able to get through it. OK. <coughs> Uh, we do. Okay. So authentication using the API. Just show the basic authentication we use currently. You have your username and password. Refresh the header. We have an authorization here, and we can uh, see the API. Obviously, trust me that if there is uh, username and password is wrong, it will. It will um, not allow you to uh, enter. So that's obvious. Uh, you can post to this URL here. I'm using the gem called Doorkeeper. Um, and if you post to OAuth and token, and you pass your username and password here, and the grant type is password, and it's the post uh, verb, you send it. Here's the response. I get a. Um, token here and access token and by default it lasts for two hours. I would show you in the SQL database if I could switch screens that it added a token to uh, a table in the database called OAuth access tokens. And so I'm going to copy and paste this token and now for future calls before I was at I was here right with domain so we're going to remove the authorization and try to send it. Obviously, it cannot. But if I enter here, access token, pass the token, uh, now for the next two hours, I can make API calls with this token and not have to send the username and password in the header each time. If you don't want to pass it in the URL, remove this. And uh, if I do authorization header, the type is called bearer. Then I pass in the token and the header here. And I send it. It works. Obviously, if I change the token, I have a freeze here. It doesn't work. Um, and that's about it. If I try to change the password, password is wrong, it says invalid grant, so I only get a token. I have a valid username and password the first time. That's it. Any questions? Uh, looks like no questions just yet, uh, but feel free to move on to the uh, turbo. Yeah, uh, can you come back because I have to switch branches and start up Rails again, so I don't want to waste time. So check back with me afterwards. Sure. Yep. All right. Um, 
Next up uh, will be Stephen, uh, first showing Errata email notifications, uh, and then he will go into the CLI and Errata views uh, now available. Hi. Um, so I'm going to show uh, three new email notifications that are uh, in Catello. Uh, so when you view your user preferences in Form and Now, uh, you can select which mail notifications you want to receive. Uh, so the three Catello ones are a notification when a promotion finishes, a notification when a sync finishes, and then a recurring post advisory report. Um, the first two here are ad hoc. They happen whenever a promotion or a sync happens. Uh, this last one here is recurring, and you can select when you want to receive it uh, on these intervals. Um, so the host advisory email gives you a summary of all of your hosts and the various types of errata that apply to them. Um, you'll notice that there's two numbers uh, for each category. The first is errata that's available today, now that you can apply to your host. The second errata here, or the second number here, shows uh, errata that's available, for example, from the library view. Um, that's you would have to promote to actually apply to the system. And then you have a dashboard here that shows the number of hosts that are affected by each category. Um, the second type of email is the synchronization summary. Uh, you get this whenever you synchronize a repo and you've subscribed to a notification for it. It gives you a summary of the new errata, and then a list of each up to the first 100. And then the last type of email notification is the promotion summary. Whenever you promote a content view, you'll get this email that shows you hosts that now have available errata. And it also gives you a summary of errata that are not applied to your hosts that are available in the content view now. Um, that's really it for the email notifications. Are there any questions? Not yet, but they may trickle in by the time you get in. OK. Uh, I'll switch over to demoing the new uh, Hammer features for uh, managing Errata. Um, so there's a couple of new features here. Um, when you view the list of content hosts, is the font big enough? And Looks good. OK. Um, when you view the list of content hosts, you'll have a new column called Available Errata. So in this case, you can see that this machine has 32 errata that are available to it. When you view the content host details for this host, you'll get a breakdown of what these errata are by category. So you can see that group by security, bug fix, and enhancement. <clears throat> if I want to see uh, which content hosts are affected by a specific errata, I can filter it like this. So this will show me all the content hosts affected by this specific errata. Um, and then if I want to go ahead and apply the errata, I can. And this will schedule the task to go ahead and apply the errata to the host. Um, the second enhancements to the errata are related to uh, actually listing and viewing the errata. So I can um, display all the details about a specific errata. So you can, this is the same view that you would get inside the UI. Um, you can also now filter and search on errata based on a variety of um, new fields. So if you look at the help here, you'll get a list of them. So you can view them by content view, um, by content view version, the environment, by organization, um, by products, repository. You can also search them by CVE. So for example, if Heartbleed or some new uh, security vulnerability comes out and you want to see if there's an erratum already available for it, you can actually search by the CVE and you'll get the result back in this list. So there's, there's uh, are affected by the CD. Um, and that's really it for the hammer errata features. Any questions? Uh, 
All right, thanks all. All right, um, a moment to see if any uh, questions trickle in. This stream is a little behind. Um, Joseph, are you going to be ready to go next? Yes, I'm ready. Um, before you uh, show off TurboLinks, there were two questions uh, that trickled in afterwards uh, for you, Joseph. Uh, sure. First is, is it any uh, faster per API call than using the token? I have not checked any performance issues, but they're making the exact same calls. The um, so I assume it's the same. Uh, it's using the uh, the user dot try to log in to get the to actually log in. Um, and I'm I just modified the authenticate um, method so when when it returns true, basically there's another row if you look at my pull request if I'm shared here. Um, I don't know if we're going to be looking at the code, but I can show you. So in the authentication, here, returns true if you authenticate, so there's just one extra OR clause. So if you, if there's a current user or um, there's a session or now there's a, it's called a doorkeeper token resource owner and it's an API request. So if these return as true, then you have, uh, you've authenticated as true. Um, so I don't see much um, performance hit there. Uh, the other question is, uh, will this allow us to limit the amount of API requests per user per time? Yes, there is scoping by what the token can do. Um, I haven't entered that. I mean, I haven't just read about it, but I haven't entered any of those. I haven't expanded the PR beyond basic authentication. All right. Uh, now, Joseph will talk about uh, TurboLinks. Okay. There's not much to show. Uh, TurboLinks is a gem. Uh, it's actually by default in Rails 4. And uh, to simplify what it does, uh, basically on any HTML page, you have the head content and you have the body. So it tries to to make the browser smart enough for an in-browser caching. So if the assets in the head, except the title, of course, if, the, if those don't change, meaning the JavaScript and CSS, then it doesn't need to reload the entire page, as most requests do. So um, it can speed things up quite a bit. Um, the only thing to show here is there is a um, Call a progress bar, very thin and blue at the top here, at the very top of the screen. And I go to Smart Proxies, and that was very fast. I don't know if anyone saw that. Let me try to go to Host. And that's a slower one. If you saw the progress bar go across. But let me just switch between Smart Proxies and Compute Resources, and you should see that once it loads the first time, the second time should be faster. So I go now to Compute resources, that was quick. I go back to smart proxies, and that was quick. I go back to compute resources. So it's TurboLinks is for a performance gain, and hopefully not break anything. That's All it. right. Uh, real quick, one other question about tokens that came in um, from Daniel. How are these tokens managed? Does the admin have to add them? No. Um, I'm not on my branch yet, but if you saw the user post to OAuth token with the correct username and password, they get a token back in the JSON response. They have that token for two hours to make API calls. So the admin doesn't have to do anything. If you're referring to applications where you have a client ID and a redirect URL, that's something that is 
possible. And doorkeeper, but that's not something I implemented in the PR because I think that's a whole other area. That um, that's if you're using, I think, applications, a lot of clients connecting to Foreman. That wasn't the idea. The idea was just to have, just to use the JSON API with Nexus token. All right. Uh, thank you much, Joseph. Okay. Uh, up next will be Partha via Mike uh, talking about uh, promoting content viewed with Docker content in the Docker pull URL. All right, I'm going to play back a video here. So give me a second to get it started here. Sprints, we showed how to create a repository of type Docker. Uh, image, Docker image uh, in the Docker registry. Uh, today, we uh, in, the, in the last sprint, in the current sprint, I guess, we added functionality to pr publish, promote, uh, add, add repos to content, view, all of the, all of that. Uh, so I'll be demonstrating that. For, I'll be showing that functionality today. Right now. So here, I guess, uh, here you see two repositories. Uh, in the, in the product federal registry, which is a uh, registry is an image also in the, in the Docker Hub, and uh, so we are, we are using the registry image for our test for our dem demo today. Uh, so let me start by creating a new content view. Here it is. I start a new content view. Call it uh, the registry again. So I create the new content view. Let me add. Uh, let me add the, the Docker repository that we have previously synced. So let me add it. I, I click on the Docker images. And here it is. I select my the registry, re report it, I sync. I then start publishing. Uh, so you, you should be able to see the repo here, the list repo page. So then I start. Then I then I start publishing. I publish a new version. Uh, yeah. So there you go. I publish a new version. Publishing right now and. As you can see, there's like two columns here, one showing the Docker images and the Docker tags that are in the new published, that are going to be in the new published repository. Once the publishing is done, you should see these numbers updated. Yeah. Now that it's published, I can I can promote it to a, I think I have a dev environment to so I'm just going to promote it to dev. And while the promotion and the public and publish and promotion is going on, I can show you like in the pulp admin that re new repositories were created that points to these environments. This contribute. Let me do that. So this is H to my machine. And there you go. There is the three Mr. Registries, the one that points to the library, and then there's the one that, that is in the dev organization. There is the registry scale. There's repository created for all of them. Uh, all right. So this should, and each of them shows that the Docker image count is 10, probably save detail. Should be able to get the tag information. This importer, this a, this image, and let me see, yeah. And there it shows. It says this has one Docker tag. I think Docker images basically clones the content of. It does the, it does what publish does for everything. Every other content type we have, it just clones the repository so that you, when you create a new container, on the formal side you can use, you can use this repo, you can use this repository to do a Docker pull. So let's uh, given this 
let me also show you the Docker pull functionality. This pretty much shows everything about the publish. Now uh, you can show how it's running via a Docker pull. Uh, let me go back to my terminal. So if I do my, uh, I'll just do Docker images. Just make sure my instance is running okay. Here are my Docker images. Let's see if I can push it up a little. Yeah, here it is. All right. So if I, so here you see in the top, it's, it's all the Docker images that are published on Tello, from the Tello satellite machine will be will be preceded by that with FUDN, and we are assuming they're always going to be running a port 5000. You can probably play with Python web crane and change the port number, but this is the standard port number. And here it is. So let us start. Uh, let's start doing a Docker pull. Let me, before that happens, let me show you like a, how to get this URL. You can, you can go to products. While it's loading, yeah. you, can, you can select, you can select the repository and go to their details. And you should be able to see a URL here. Publish that URL that you can use as the Docker pull URL. You can just copy this. You can pretty much copy this line and say Docker pull on that. Uh, it's the same, it's going to be the same thing for for a content view version, also a content view. So you can just say FUDN, port number, and then you can say default organization and environment. Instead, in my case, and what is the content view I had? The content, the content view we just created. believe it's Mr. Registry, yeah. It's just three, there you go. There you go. And this should pretty much, that was pretty quick because I had previously synced the registry image on this machine, but this is pretty much what the Docker pool does. It just pulls the content out of the, onto the Docker host, or the host that is serving the Docker containers. You can use that. Now we can do like a Docker run on this, and you should be able to pretty much log in and play with it, play with the container if needed. And the foreman side does that, but this should be a good this the side of the the Catello and Pulp side of this the, the Pulp side of the export does all this. Uh, is this pretty much it? Questions? Yeah, is that currently available in master? Oh, never mind. Uh, no, it's not. Uh, all right. Uh, thanks, Partha, via Mike, uh, for that. Uh, next up is Walden uh, to show content host listing uh, for an individual errata. All right. Um, so here you can see the uh, the errata list page. Um, and if you go to an individual, you're sharing. We can't see anything, Walden. Oh, really? Oh. Yeah. Hmm. Let me try that again. There we go. We good now? Yep. All right, cool. So if you go to an individual errata um, by clicking on it in the list, um, go to this content host tab here, um, and this will show you all of the affected content hosts. You can filter by environment, um, and here's a, here's a little sneak preview. This isn't in master yet, but eventually you'll be able to confirm your uh, um, applying the errata. And let me show you one that has an actual incremental update. Um, so if you had an incremental update, you'd see this screen, which will show you um, 
what was going to happen to the affected content view, um, just a confirmation screen before. Um, that part's not mastered yet, as I said, um, but just figured I'd throw that in there real quick for those interested. Uh, one other thing I'm going to show real quick, I'm going to reclaim some of the uh, time that was uh, used before. Uh, this repositories page um, just shows all the repositories that contain the errata. You can uh, filter by environment here as well um, and by content view and search. Uh, oops, go to this one. Um, and that's pretty much it. Just a couple of read-only views at the at the moment. Um, so if there's any questions, uh, I'll fill them. And if not, that's it. All right, we'll give it just a moment to see if any questions come up. All right. Uh, thanks, Walden. Up next will be David showing us uh, removing Docker images and Puppet modules uh, from repositories. All right. Um, so last iteration, I worked on um, Docker um, removing Docker images. Um, we already had managed packages in place, um, so it was just a case of making the uh, code generic and so it could be applied to Docker images, and we kind of got Puppet modules, uh, removing Puppet modules for free. So I'm going to demo um, uh, removing Puppet modules first. So I'm going to create a uh, uh, product. I'm going to create a Puppet uh, repo. And I'm just going to upload um, three Puppet modules to my uh, Puppet repo. So now my repo has uh, three Puppet modules, as you can see. <clears throat> so I'm going to go in and remove one of the Puppet modules to demonstrate the feature, the new feature. So let me remove MySQL. And now my uh, repo only has two modules, ACL and standard lib. And we can verify two pub modules there. And so basically, I can do the same thing with a, a Docker repo. Uh, so let me go ahead and create a uh, Docker repository. And I'm just going to use um, BusyBox from Docker Hub. You see, it has five tags. I'm going to remove one of the images. And I'll remove an image with the tag so you can see how that works, because it will also remove the tag as well from the repository. So let me sync the repository so I get some tags and images. Now I'll go into my uh, repository. I'll click on Manage Docker Images. You can see it has 10 images, 5 tags. 
And after I remove it, it will be nine images, four tags. Let me just pick a Docker image here. Click remove. You can see I have nine images now. If I go back and see the tags, I only have four tags. So that's pretty much it. Were there any questions? No? I'll hang out uh, in case there are questions that come up later. All right. That sounds like a good plan, actually. Um, thanks, David. Uh, next, uh, we'll do Justin, who's going to talk about the incremental update APIs and scope search autocomplete for Arata. All righty. Um, <clears throat> I assume you can see my screen. So basically, there's an issue currently with um, the existing Catello, where introducing an update to a content view is is a little bit cumbersome, especially if you want to do it uh, out of band with your normal content view promotion process. So uh, we designed a feature called incremental or incremental update that will allow a user to basically uh, incrementally update a content view with a, a small change, a single errata, a couple packages, a pu few puppet modules, things like that. Um, and as part of that, that change, we've actually introduced uh, minor version numbers to content view versions. So here you see I have version 1.0 that originally was published to library and dev, um, and then version 1.1, which is was an incremental update um, which had one errata plus any package dependencies that are needed. And as you can see, there are um, about nine, nine packages differences or difference between the two content view versions. Um, I'll show you here going through a manual incremental update. Uh, we won't wait for it to finish because it uh, may take a couple minutes. But as you see on this SE Linux errata, um, there's one content view or content host here that, that needs this errata, but if we um, filter what's actually available to, or what systems have this errata available, it's not there. So we see right off that um, this system needs the errata in its content view and lifecycle environment because it's not there. Um, so I'll move over to Postman and you can see the API that was created for this and Walden sort of started to demo the UI that he's working on. Um, but I'm specifying the content view version. The environment IDs, I want to go ahead and push it to. In this case, it's library and dev. And I want to resolve the dependencies. And let me confirm that that's the correct errata ID. And it is. OK. Um, and I should just be able to hit send. And it kick off a, a new incremental update. Yep. Um, so now if we refresh this version screen, I believe we should see it in, oop, in progress. And so now you see we have version 1.2 being promoted, or it's being uh, published and promoted to library and uh, dev. And looking at the API um, documentation, we can actually see uh, all the options. It supports errata IDs, package IDs, um, and puppet module IDs. And puppet modules, um, if you're specifying a puppet module, that or a newer version of a puppet module that already exists, it replaces the puppet module that is currently in the view. And there's you can optionally resolve dependencies um, and specify multiple content view version IDs, multiple RADA IDs 
for each content view version ID. And okay, um, I'll go on to well, actually, yeah, I'll go on to my next uh, feature, which was auto completion of errata. So in a previous sprint, we had created or we had switched errata over from Elasticsearch to Scope Search, which involved pulling in all the errata data into the database. So if, uh, but autocomplete was not functioning um, at that time. So we w went back and added support for that, which involved um, adding support in our Angular code to uh, render the autocomplete properly. So as you can see, I can search by package name, And um, it should return all the Arado with the package name kernel. And I think, actually, there's a bug open about the, some of the searches. But um, as you can see, the autocomplete works just fine. And this was added in such a way that, essentially, on a uh, Bastion resource, all you have to do, oh, sorry. Apparently, I'm not supposed to show code. But anyways, um, this was added in such a way that uh, you can easily add support for autocomplete for any model in Catello um, that's using Bastion simply by adding one little line, uh, basically indicating that that model supports autocomplete. And then every new two-pane page that's using autocomplete, uh, or that's, that's using new two-pane, will pick it up automatically. And that's it. Uh, I'll stop sharing. All right. Thank you, Justin. Uh, up next, um, Mike will play another video uh, by from Dustin uh, showing gutter ball uh, running inside uh, the context of Catello. All right, so, give me a sec, get it started here. All right, so this is uh, D Dustin's demo just showing that we have uh, Gutterball running within the context of Catello. It's pretty short. Hi, this is Dustin with the Catello team, and uh, I worked on um, the Gutterball uh, installation along with uh, Catello. So uh, right now when you install Catello, Gutterball comes down with it, and uh, uh, that exists in the uh, Tomcat container that uh, channel can swap. And I've uh, got a fresh uh, box here that I just installed Catello on. Uh, that my demo. Uh, next steps are to add the Ryan CLI bits part of the installation process. And, uh, that's it for me. Thanks. And that's it. All right. Thank you, Mike and Dustin. Uh, up next, uh, we have uh, activation key auto attach with Christine. Um. Are you there, Christine? I'm here. I'm just trying to figure out. How, oh, there we go. OK. <clears throat> All right. Can you see my screen? You can. You can? OK. Yes. Thank you. Um, so the auto attach feature will um, essentially allow a key to attach any subscription possible on a key rather than failing if 
any subscription is not available. Um, so here I've had three keys all with the same subscription with the exception of this one. I'm going to use this one key to um, get rid of the, to consume the one out of one on this uh, rel with smart virtualization. Um, I subscribe this. It registers it. And come over here. You can see that the one out of one subscription on that key has been utilized. So when, when I come and register this machine with the auto attach key set to true. It subscribes it. And you can see it's subscribed not with, um, oops, sorry. Not with that one utilized um, subscription, but one of the other ones. Now, I don't think Candle Pin is doing this properly because I'm under the impression that when I register with the auto attach set to false, it should fail. But what it is actually doing is registering the systems with all remaining subscriptions, um, which I, I don't think is, is how it's supposed to be working. But I've, I've let Candle Pin know a couple of times and um, I'm not sure when it'll be fixed, but um, you can see this has been registered with auto attach set to false, and instead of failing it, it now has both remaining subscriptions on the key attached. So somebody can correct me if I'm wrong on that, but I'm um, pretty sure that's not working correctly. All right. Thank you, Christine. Uh, moving along, up next we have Steve uh, to show the progress of uh, our scope search migration by looking at GPG keys and sync plans. All right, can you hear me? Sounds good. Okay. And you can see my screen? Uh, I could. Now it's back to you, just you. Can you see that now? I can now. Uh, okay. So never mind my crazy menu bar here. Um, I'm adding, uh, rewiring some of the uh, searching to go use scope search. Um, and uh, for what we have right now is GPG keys and sync plans. So I'm on the GPG key screen. You can see that autocomplete is also wired in there. Um, you can search, get results. Um, also switch over to the sync plans and same thing. Um, well, we should have that wired in there. I don't see why that's not working there. Oh, let's add a couple. So 
I go in here and search, oh, why am I not getting any? Well, it does work, but GPG keys is demonstrating properly. So uh, name equals, you know, get the, the whole thing here. So that's all I've got. All right. Thanks, Steve. Uh, next, uh, we'll move on to Adam to show uh, content management commands for host collections now available in Hammer. All right, great, thank you. Uh, I'm sharing my screen for you already. Uh, so what I'm going to show to you is we have, uh, I'm not going to actually show them functioning because that would require me to sync a whole lot of data and then have uh, a few clients registered to then actually be able to complete some of these actions. So I'm just going to show you that they're there and show you that they have options, but uh, they do work. Um, and if they don't, then you need to file a bug. Um, but yeah, they should work. So what we're talking about today is uh, host collection actions. So um, what that means is uh, the ability to install, uh, remove, and also update uh, packages, package groups, and errata. Um, so I'm going to show you the, the command structure of what we have here. Uh, so we have our host collection, hammer host collection commands, and then you can see that we have the ability to install, update, remove packages, uh, install, update, and remove package groups, and then lastly, the ability to install erratum. Um, and so we can just look at the options for one of these. Host collection... So what you would give it is uh, the ID or the name of the host collection, the organization that it is contained in, and then lastly, a comma-separated list of packages. So your command would probably look like, um, or, you know, you'd have your organization, you'd have your ID, and then for packages, well, uh, you just have a comma-separated list, and you would run that, and... Um, it would install those packages uh, within that on all the systems that are included in that host collection. Same for uh, update and also removal. Uh, you would just give it a comma separated list of packages and it would um, execute those on those machines. Uh, that's it for me. Is there any, any questions? Uh, we'll just hang around in case anyone does have any questions. Uh, Alrighty. I'll do that. Thanks, Adam. Thank uh, next up, we'll move on to um, Martin uh, to show Kappa Wizards Wizarding Library. <clears throat> Hi. Uh, during the uh, last sprint, I was working on a uh, live CD feature. And part of that was uh, adding ability to set up a networking to form an installer. Uh, I wanted to re reuse uh, most of the work done in StayPoft installer, and part of that was uh, uh, or were interactive forms or wizards uh, gathering the configuration data. Uh, I made them more generic and standalone, and possible to uh, reuse in other in other places such as uh, Hammer CLI, for example. Uh, OHAD had an uh, interesting idea if it would be possible to optionally render the form as graphical user interface, and I liked that idea, so I uh, added support for uh, multiple uh, rendering backends. Uh, currently, we have only CLI, which is implemented with the uh, Highline library, but there are plans for graphical user interface uh, doing through uh, yet tool or uh, or Zenity, and even uh, web-based uh, backend, which will uh, run probably some simple uh, web web server, and you will be able to go through the forms in your web browser. Uh, now I will show you a simple simple form. Um, okay, this is this one. Uh, you probably are familiar with the with the appearance, which is same as was in uh, state of the installer. 
there is a uh, name, name of the form and uh, some optional uh, help. Uh, there is a list of the current values added in the, in the uh, form and there are some actions. Uh, in, in, this, in this backend, the buttons, the default buttons are at the top. Uh, and uh, the rest of the buttons uh, are at the bottom and uh, in between there are changes uh, for changing the values. Uh, I, can, I can show you how to set up the password. If I, uh, if I do some, uh, some simple one, uh, it will validate the values and uh, ask me again because uh, there are some, some restrictions. I try to type correct one, uh, which which passed, and uh, the values were updated, which is not visible because uh, the password is hidden, and a uh, new set of options is uh, offered. Uh, if I finish the form uh, in in the script, I uh, printed uh, name of the button that submitted the form and also the values that were that were typed in uh, i can show you how how the source code looks like it's pretty simple here is definition of the wizard and here we are adding adding the fields and then you just run the wizards and uh, read the values here and that's it uh, there are some more uh, features built in. Uh, there are more field types. There are uh, there is support for adding custom uh, field types and uh, for modifying the uh, built-in ones. Uh, there is also a possible to add validations, uh, validations per field or per whole form. Uh, there is also support for some interactivity like that there are fields that can influence uh, other fields in the form. Uh, if, if you like it, the library is called uh, Kafo Wizards and uh, live in the form and uh, organization. So check it there. There are some more examples in the uh, doc examples uh, directory. And if you are interested, uh, let me know. And that's it. All right. Thank you, Martin. Uh, last up uh, is myself uh, quickly showing um, a change that we made to the Red Hat repositories page around kickstart repos. Uh, so previously under the RPMs tab uh, we would display uh, for example under RHEL Linux server uh, we would display both RPMs and uh, Kickstart repository sets and repos. Uh, that has uh, now been moved out to its own uh, tab at the top. So if you click on Kickstarts, you should only find uh, Kickstart repos. The other change uh, that we made is that when viewing uh, a Kickstart uh, set of repositories, only uh, point release repositories uh, will be displayed uh, to the user. Uh, we are in intentionally hiding uh, the Kickstart 6 server repos, note only the Kickstart repos, uh, to enforce uh, the interaction that a user picks a particular point release of Kickstart repos. Uh, because the six server kickstart repos don't work the same as the regular six server RPM repos. Um, and for uh, users that had previously uh, enabled on an older system had enabled the six server kickstart repos, those will still show up uh, for the user as being enabled. Um, however, if the user then goes in and disables them, uh, they will disappear from the view from there on out. Um, this also applies to the API. Um, we are generally across the board hiding from users um, the server. Eric, they can't see your screen. Oh, what? You are focused on Martin. 
Well, I clicked share to everyone. You would think that that would present it to everyone like it says it's doing. <laughs> Uh, so uh, remember all that I just said without getting to see it, um, and then just look at this. Uh, there's the tab at the top. Uh, there's the Kickstarter repos. Uh, and again, note there is no server Kickstarter repos being displayed for the user anymore. All right. Uh, are there any final questions? I will give it about 30 or so seconds uh, for any questions to pop up. All righty. Well, that concludes our second joint Foreman Catello Sprint demo. Thank you to all the presenters that showed off today. Thank you to all those that are viewing it in real time and asked questions. Uh, looks like we do have one question coming in at the end. Uh, will we end up hiding the non-kickstart x.y repos as well and have users only rely on filters instead. It seems to introduce some confusion there as well. Uh, that is not uh, something that we have necessarily discussed, but I believe from what I understand there is still value in having the uh, lower point releases available uh, to users as a Uh, someone, uh, Justin or Mike, may have better information. I would uh, ask them uh, on IRC uh, if you. Uh, and then the qu last question is, so where do we find the six server kickstarts? Um, again, uh, we have decided and hidden them uh, from all user views. Uh, again, if you look on the UI or the API, you will not see the six server kickstarts returned as a way to discourage users from uh, using them. Uh, since the six server kickstarts, as I understand it, always point to the latest uh, point release. Yes, this is basically a simulate for point release. Uh, which is different than how the uh, six server RPMs uh, repo works. But that's the exact same way. Yeah. And why are we? It, uh, there's a lot of confusion that six server means 6.0, but that is not the case. And that, I'm not sure if that's what um, you, you were assuming as well, Adrian. Um, but six server is actually pointing to like 6.4, and then when 6.5 is released, all the content is replaced by the 6.5 big start. So it's Confusing, and it's not what most people want. It's to uh, I'm under the impression that it's much better for the user to pick the Kickstarter tree that they explicitly want, and when a new one is released, to go in and pick that one explicitly as well. Thank you, Justin, for the in-room assist. All right, uh, that concludes the demo. Thanks again to everyone. Uh, we'll see you next time.